That was really a good question. Okay. Um, let me begin. So I'm going to talk about um, something called constraint satisfaction problem, so CS. Hey, you, can you just move it somewhere closer? Okay. I'll get it. So can I put it in here? Yeah. Uh -huh. So CSP, um, so CSP is a not just a single problem, it's a class of problems, and it is parameterized by two things. So first one is an integer k. Integer k. And the second one is a something called predicate. P, which is a subset of F2 to the K. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about Boolean CSP. So like each variable can take out values either 0 or 1. So given these two things, so I'm going to call the problem called max CSP, which is parameterized by um, P. So this is now one problem. So its input is the input is a n, which is a number of variables. And then it's going to have a set of constraints, c, um, m constraints, where each ci, each constraint ci, consists of a subset, or like tuple of k variables, si and vi. So si is a tuple of k variables. So I'm just going to assume that each variable is indexed by an integer between 1 and n. And each vi, it's called shift, shift vector. It is it's just a vector in f2 to the k. And this is an input and output. We need to output um, assignment. assignment phi, which just gives a 0 or a 1 to every variable. And what are we trying to maximize for the objective? Um, I'm going to say that for each constraint C, so I'm going to drop this subtract here. So each constraint C, I'm going to say C is satisfied when, so let me call that S has a K variable, so S1 to SK, and V is a K dimensional vector, so let me just call like V1 through VK. So given um, an assignment, I'm gonna say like this constraint C is satisfied when, when this thing happened, is in predicate P. So this is the basic definition of CSP, and then we want to try, um, we want to find the, the assignment that maximizes the number of satisfied constraints. Okay, and then I'm gonna, um, and then, so given an instance, I'm gonna call opt to be the maximum value. Um, normalize so that its maximum is always one, and then its minimum is zero. So this is kind of like very abstract definition of CSP. And then let me give an example. So one um, probably famous example is a max k set. So in this definition, so given for fixed k, so p is uh, everything, everything except all zero vector. So such that. So given a like given a formula that has a goes like something like this, then this um, close can be represented as a constraint where um, S V where S is a one, two, three, P 
because it has a x1, x2, x3. And then v is a 0, 1, 0, which means that we are going to flip the value of the second variable, and then, and then we're going to apply p. So this is our first example. And then second example is a max k x o r. Here, apparently, so p is a set of vectors such that their sum is 0. Okay, so um, here, this means that the sum over f2. And then, so using this definition, so let me, this linear equation can be encoded as the same way, sv, where s is uh, still 1 to 3. But v, um, we can have like multiple values, there are many choices. So v can, v can be 0, 1, 0, 0, or like, any choice will work, because it's going to flip the sign of the outcome, anyway. So, so actually, um, this, so some people don't like this definition in the sense that um, some people don't like the existence of a shift vector. So probably the most general version of CSP is that we have not just one predicate, but like multiple predicates, and then each constraint can choose its own predicate. Uh, and then we don't, we don't need this shift vector. So it's more, you know, general, it's, it's more general in the sense that, so any like shift vector, we can get rid of shift vector and then like put another predicate here. But um, I think in computer science, many people look at this version. So that version is strictly more general, right? Yeah, so like, yeah, this, most, yeah, strictly more general, yes. So for example, yeah, if you look at max cut, so max cut probably you can do is uh, we can say like p k is equal to two and p is uh, just zero one and one zero. So definitely if you use this then then the resulting problem is a uh, is some generalized max cut but it's not like exactly max cut. So but this yeah let me just use this. Um, I mean the yeah. <coughs> If you use this thing, it's just two XOR, right? Yeah. So why did you say it was a generalization of max cut? Um, in a sense that, like, yeah. So if you look at this problem and then you don't, you always take like shift vector to be all zero, then you get exactly max cut. Okay. But if you right. use the shift vector, then it's, it's a slightly more generalization of a max cut problem. Okay. So that's the definition of um, CSP, and then so. I think the um, one of very interesting question is that for fixed k, so what's the what's the approximation ratio for any any CSP with um, where the predicate is contained in f2 to the k. So what's the worst case approximation ratio that holds for any CSP with um, k, rtk? So, um, so I think for every CSP, for every max CSP, there's a like, very um, trivial approximation algorithm, which assigns every value, every variable uh, value between, with value um, 0 or 1, we probably have. And then, so the trivially, so, and then this strategy will satisfy every constraint with probability um, size of p divided by 2 to the k. <coughs> so this is a trivial algorithm. So we know that at least there is a 1 over 2 to the k approximation. Sounds uh, very pessimistic. But uh, like um, another algorithm is uh, due to Charikar and Makarchev and Makarchev. They show that for any KCSP, whatever the P is, we can get 
C times K divided by 2 to the K approximation. So C is a universal constant. It's around 0 0.44. So this is, uh, I think this is currently the best approximation algorithm for any KCSP. And then, so this is from our algorithm side, and then we want to say that this is essentially the optimal. So this is our goal. And, and is, that, is that algorithm very complicated, or? Um, it just uses a basic, ba basic SDP relaxation, and then somehow use a rounding algorithm, but rounding algorithm is, a, um, yeah, some, involves some like, non-trivial calculations. So um, before introducing hardness result, result uh, let me introduce um, three definitions. So our first defi definition says that it's definition of predicates. So the first definition says that P is pairwise independent. So PI. If if we consider um, uniform distribution on P, so let's say that X is drawn uniformly from P, then two things happen. So first one is uh, for all coordinate, um, probability that i bit is one, which is equal to probably that i is equal to zero is exactly equal to half. So this is a uh, that is this. Not to derail this too much, but um, in the case when your predicate is like k or yes, um, or like the size of the predicate, or size of p is exactly one. Yes. Do you know if this is the best approximation ratio you can get? Or k. Yeah, like the trivial algorithm would give you one over two to the k, and you might think, oh, maybe that's the best, but then you can do k over two to the k. What is k or? K or is like. Oh, sorry, K and. K and. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's, it's the best. Okay, you might be able to do better. Yeah. Okay. I mean, on the same yeah. line, is there any type CS, like any CSP for which that thing is type? This one? Yeah. Um, I don't think so because, like, the, the people, usually the peop way the people do is, uh, they prove like some predicate and they prove that it is approximately re resistant. Um, I'm gonna define it later. But this uh, weird number doesn't usually appear in that context. Probably yeah, if you wanna do this, then probably you want to take a real CSP and then like put hardness without being approximately resistant, right? I don't think people actually match this constant. So I think, yeah, I think end. So what they did was like they re so they reduced every CSP to max n without loss of generality, just you can like break the predicate to into like many copies of n. So I think n is a kind of like worst the hardest right. case. And then so like in even in this definition, I'm slightly lying in the sense that usually like when they say like when people say p supports pairwise independent distribution. It means that there exists a pairwise independent distribution whose support is included in P. But I'm gonna just define this for simplicity. So anyway, so so first condition is this, and the second condition is that for any two coordinates, so all these four possibilities. Happens in probably one of four. So this is a definition of pairwise independence. And then the second definition is called pairwise. So if pairwise independent subgroup, so pairwise independent subgroup, when P is pairwise independent, and so P as a subset of F2 to the K is subgroup. So <laughs> by subgroup, I mean that it's just closed under the addition. 
So this is a pairwise independent subgroup. And then third definition I'm going to say is a... Sorry, uh, this P is some kind of distribution. It's not the predicate. Um, so, so yeah, I, I assume that, so when I talk about these definitions, um, we, only, we always consider the uniform distribution of P. Yeah, P is like a set. Yeah, P is like a set, but I'm going to... If when we did, when we think about these definitions, we are always thinking that uniform distribution of P. And then, so the third definition is a so P has a dual distance at least three. So what I mean is that. So P, this definition says that P is first of all subgroup. Probably I'm gonna also like call it subspace as well. And then if P is a subgroup, then we can define P orthogonal to be the um, vectors such that inner product between X and Y for all y is in P. So I meant this. So this is just a inner product. I mean, this is just a, like that product. I'm not giving any like linear algebraic meaning here. So it's, a, it's just like inner, I mean, inner product um, over the field F2. And then you can also see that um, this P orthogonal is also a subgroup. And then I'm going to say that, so you will certainly have like zero. And then you will have other elements. And then I'm going to say that, then uh, for any non zero vector in this P perp, so subgroup, it has a, at least, at least three ones. So yeah, so if you're familiar with the um, coding theory, so this, mm -hmm. this is a linear code, and this is a minimum distance. Shouldn't zero always be in there, though? Yeah, zero is always in. Well, the non yeah, so yeah, for, yeah, yeah, for non-zero. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Wait, so this is, sorry, P has dual distance at least two? Three. Three. Three, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so in the max KXOR example, Yes. First, you'd have to, for it to even be a subgroup, you have to flip all the parity, or the, the bit strings. And yeah, so maybe. like for but max then, what, so what, what's the What's the dual distance of that one? Do you know? I guess it's the. Uh... Like this KF, yeah, so you, you have to negate them all because none of these are, this is not subgroup itself, P. Uh, so what was your question? No. Well, I don't. I think this P is a subgroup. P is a subgroup. Yeah. So this P is a subgroup. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm looking at the things below it. Yeah, that P is a subgroup. Yeah. yeah. The, so I'm looking at the B's below. I mean, just. I mean, only has distance one, right? Because you just. Well. Okay. Wait. I don't know. I think the only things in there. Is this one? Yeah. I mean, you could take like two things that. Sum up to one, yeah, and that happens, then oh. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, that's that's only it's only got dimension one, because this has dimension n minus one, or k minus one. Oh, okay. Right, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that. But that does have total distance three. Oh, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if k is three. And then, and then yeah. Yeah, or if k is three. Yeah. Okay, we're good. So that's dual distance k in general. Okay, so like, yeah, so it's, uh, so I introduced like three dimensions, okay. and then, um, it is not hard to see, like 2 implies 1, for sure. And, and it's not hard to see that like 3 also implies 2. So, so why is it called dual distance? Because over F2, the perp space is the same as a dual? I mean, like the perp set is the same as a dual set or something? Yes, it's uh, like linear algebra, because it's kind of like orthogonal space. Like, I mean, my question was, why wouldn't you call it perpendicular distance? But I guess, like, I think P, P perpendicular is the same as P dual over F2. Yeah, yeah, Because okay. well, it can't probably, be anything yeah, else. Probably it's like originating from, like, Quinn theory, so probably we should ask how to work later. 
Yeah, dual discipline sounds better too. <laughs> we call it profanity coming to this. Sounds terrible. No, it's, I, I mean, you get the alliteration here. Yeah, yeah, dual discipline. And then I think, so, so these um, three definitions are actually strict containment. So there's like something that belongs here, that belongs here, that doesn't belong here, and so on. But I think, so even in the Boolean case, in, in F2 case, I think there is a strict separation between 1 and 2. But I don't know whether there is a strict separation between 2 and 3. So probably it might not separate it. So I'm going to assume, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume like 3 and 2 which is just 3, and then use whatever property they yeah. have. 2 implies pairwise independence? Because it's part of the definition. Yeah, it's part of the definition. It's a subgroup and pairwise independence. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. A and B implies B. <laughs> That's very clever of you. <laughs> so the reason I introduced like, these three definitions is that I want to introduce like, one like, nice predicate. So this. So I'm gonna show like one predicate which is uh, actually is belongs to all three categories. So let's say that. So I'm gonna construct the matrix H. H of L. So this is a matrix. Um, how much is it? Zero and one. And it's a 2 to the L by 2 to the L matrix. It's a like, large matrix. And its, it's row and column are both indexed by um, L dimensional vector. So its row is uh, indexed by some vector, and then Y is a uh, indexed by some vector, L dimensional vector. And then the entry of yx is the inner product of y and x. So this is a matrix. So it's like 2TL by 2TL matrix. So if you look at this matrix, then um, if you look at the first column and first row, which corresponds to vectors, zero vectors, then we know that all these are zero. And then you're gonna fill up the rest of the, tab rest of the table. And then one nice property of this, I mean three nice properties of this matrix is that it's a symmetric. And then the second property is uh, every pair of row are orthogonal, again in F2 sense. So from this, what we know is that if you look at, let me, yeah, let me just focus on actually column. So if you look at the first column, and then like every other column is orthogonal to first column, means that, so, Every other column will have uh, exactly half ones and half zeros. No. Sorry. No. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Orthogonal. Well, it is true. We have ones and zeros, but. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, actually, this matrix was defined as like plus one minus one matrix, and then actually the orthogonal was uh, over R. Well, yeah, let me just say that then actually like each column will have a half ones and half zeros. And then if you look at two um, columns, then... Um, you just want that if you add two columns, that it sums to zeros? Yeah. If you, or if, 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 you, if, you sum, sum, if you sum them, they have an even number. Yeah, they have an Or equal number of zeros and ones is what you're looking for, right? Yeah. Yes. And then, yeah, if you look at the two... So if you sum two columns? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. And then if you look at two like columns, then they will agree in exactly half of the positions. Yep. Which is, yeah, exactly. Okay, so any subtotext or anyone, they all want? Pardon? Any subtotext or anyone, they all want? Yeah, 
And the assumptive things, do anyone want the all one for the no. one? You want basically no, you, you want them to agree in half the position. Yeah. So the sum of them, yeah. Yeah. They, they agree if their sum is zero and disagree if their sum is one. Oh, oh I see, because you take the sum of all. Yeah, sorry. I should, yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry, what did you just say? So if you, if you sum two numbers in F2, mm -hmm. they agree if their sum is zero, they disagree if their sum is one. So what's happening here, you sum two columns, half the, half the numbers you get are zeros, it's half the number product, one. It's an inner product, right? So you're taking the product first and then your sum. Uh, ignore the word in the yeah, yeah, pretend that he never wrote that. Um, the inner product makes sense when it's over plus or minus one. Mm -hmm. But I think that statement should be true as well, right? But like, it's kind of meaningless, you know, I can inner product everything with the all zeros vector. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really what he's asking for, I think. So I think so these... He's asking for the, you know, what you kind of want is that they look pairwise independent, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, I, I is this statement fine? This statement I agree with. Yeah, so every pair of the rules or every pair of the columns should agree in exactly like half of the position. Mm -hmm. Then you know that if you look at any column, then it will have like half ones and half zeros. And then if you look at this, even if you look at like two columns, then you will see like quarter of like zero, zero, quarter of half, one, one, and all so on. So, and then, and then third one, it is um, close under addition. This one is over F2, I guess. The rows are closed under addition? Yes, because uh, the way we construct yeah. this. So it has these three nice properties. And then, so with these things, we can say that it belongs to, oh, I, I haven't defined P yet. So then P, so we are going to define P. And suppose that um, K. So say, say k is something between 2 to the l minus 1 and strictly less than 2 to the l. So we want to construct a good predicate p for this value k. And then the way we are going to do is uh, we are going to take a last k columns, k columns of this portion. And then, so let me this, um, call the, this sum matrix as H prime. And then, so P is uh, simply rows of H prime. For any k. For any k is the yeah. in that range. Yeah, in that range. So we can't take the, the first column because it's like all zeros. So it, it's violating this pairwise independent condition, but otherwise, as long as we are um, taking everything except one, then we're fine. So you can also check that this also satisfies number two there. So this is the predicate. What is H prime? Sorry? What is H prime? H prime is a sum matrix of H which takes um, the last k columns. So it's, uh, it's uh, 2 to the L by k matrix. So yeah, just so I understand, so the area of this predicate is k, and correspond the, the, the rows of h prime have size k. And you're going to get 2 to the L, all, you're always going to get 2 to the L different accepting assignments? Okay, yes. Um, but since you're truncating, could it be the case that some of them are the same? Um, it's not because like if it, any two rows um, will agree on exactly half of the uh, and then like we are like, at least like not taking the first one. Yeah. So well, that's why you need k at least two to the minus one. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of yeah, that's kind of easy. So in reality, I think uh, like a similar example would be you're fine with. Like any matrix with orthogonal columns that also satisfy like exactly half ones and zeros in each. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. So that's what um like makes a difference between pairs of independence and pairs of independence subgroup. So I think like if you just for one pair of independence, then you don't need to have like then actually like for other values of L, which is not necessarily power of two, we can have that matrices as well. So so that actually gives a like better hardness for assuming any gains or like for other things. But I think like in order to subgroup properly, actually this is the 
quite the, the only one in this region. So yeah, so if um, yeah, so like if k is uh, like power of two minus one, then like size of p is uh, k plus one, and if um, k is like exactly power of two, then uh, size of p is a uh, two k. So normally, like people, when people say like they have a like hardness approximation over like hardness of approximation of vector like two k divided by two to the k, this is for that reason. Okay, so yeah, this is one nice predicate that satisfies um, one, two, and indeed three, but I'm not that sure. So this would, yeah, so you just said sometimes it can prove hardness of approximation factors that are 2k over 2 to the k? Yeah, actually. And that yeah. looks similar to CMM, except does, do you know the constant that CMM gets? It's not like, two. Yeah, it's like. Oh, did you write someone? 0 0.44. Oh, 0 0.44. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Should be two. But actually, I mean, it's, uh, if k is this, this number, then like it's k plus 1. So you can like, generally get more than like 1. Mm. Yeah, so I think, so yeah, if you assume unique games, then actually like we are going to have a like much nicer matrix than this, than this, and then like this one will give you that, so then actually we can always the, take the predicate P such that size of P is at most K plus 4 or something. So I think like one is closer. But I don't know, like, between like 1 and 0 0.4. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, given these definitions, I'm going to actually, like, um, do another definition. Sorry, so I'm a little confused. So if I truncate at some point and I add two cops, can't I get the all singles? Oh, actually, it's like, yeah. but, but the predicate is the rows of H prime. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right. So... I'm gonna introduce another notations. So this is slightly orthogonal to what I'm talking about, but so first notation is the so like predicate P is a approximation resistant when for any epsilon greater than zero, it's NP hard to distinguish. Two cases. So first case is opt is uh, is at least one minus epsilon, and second case is this at most the trivial approximation ratio plus epsilon. So this is the definition of approximation resistance, and then the second definition is uh, approximation resistance under UGC. This is a, and third definition is about like gaps. So I'm gonna say that Shirley Adams hierarchy or Lasser hierarchy, even though I haven't defined it yet, so has gaps um, if the following is true. For any epsilon greater than zero, there exists eta, which is also non-zero, such that there exists an instance of max CSP with predicate P, such that, so the first, so value of Shell Adams or Lasser hierarchy is one, even after eta times n rounds. So what does one mean? Does it mean you're satisfying everything? Yeah, everything. Okay. Where, where the actually the true value of the instance is the just the trivial approximation ratio here. By the way, is that supposed to be true to the k over size of p? Like the reciprocal? No. Okay. 
So the so actually it's like very strong sense yeah, yeah, yeah. because like I want to construct a gap after linear number rounds. But um this is what I So beta is a constant. Yeah, it, it yeah. depends so, on it, it depends, depends on only on epsilon and k. I see. And the and the predicate. Yeah. So like yeah, these are like four notions of some kind of hardness. So this is just NP hardness, and then this is a hardness um, assuming any games conjecture, and then these two things are hardness for some um, restricted computation models, which is complex hierarchies. So if I um, so with these notions of predicates and these notions of hardness, I'm gonna finally draw the table. So I think people believe that like, whenever P um, is pairwise independent, the problem is extremely hard. But this, um, so this is unknown yet. So when P is pairwise independent, it's unknown that like, it's NP-hard to say that P is approximation resistant. But all the other things are filled. Let me do it in chronological way. So, so Austrian and Mosel first proved that if like P is pair is independent, then it's assuming unique games, it's hard to approximate. It's approximation resistant. And then in the same year, um, these guys proved that if P um, is pair is independent, there's also oh, sorry. Um, Benabas, Georgiou, Megan, and Tusian. So they prove that if like P is pair is independent, there's a shell and gap here. And then in the same year, um, Tusiani said that actually if like P is category three, then it will have a lesser gap as well. And then and then in his uh, great breakthrough, Chan proved that if um, P is a pair in the subgroup, actually it's n -pared. And then it's not his main result, but he also showed that if um, And so you said the 2 cn result also assumes the dual distance thing? Yeah, so 2 cn assumes dual distance thing. But then, not Chan. Yeah, but yeah, Chan yeah, is assumed like, yeah, so, yeah, which is a weaker assumption. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. Chan 13 here. You need another column for the total thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that that's yeah. So total total is all the way at the bottom chain is one thing above. Yeah, but I right. think yeah, yeah. So I don't distinguish that in Boolean case. So yeah, I see. And then very recently, so, so one one point is that it actually doesn't like just putting NP hardness doesn't imply anything about the circuit. Right. I think so. But actually, yeah, you need to work hard. And actually, yeah, circuit there's only one like work. Mm -hmm. Which did that, which like pushes the like, gap instance for NPR problem all the way through the adoption. And many, I think like the sense that many people like believe that it's gonna be true unless like you do like good things in your adoption. Mm -hmm. But I think like there's there's like only one work and only one person who's done that. So and that's Chang. And that's like Tutsiani. Okay. Actually, yeah, yeah, this paper's contribution has like it has like two major contributions. What first one is this, and then actually second one is uh, he showed like 1.36 lesser gap for vertex power. Following the earlier NPR of the new software. Ah. So this paper actually has like two major contributions. I see. Did he have to go to like every step of dinner software? Mm -hmm. I haven't read that, but I don't, I don't think he did this then other yeah. Okay. Well, it's like, painful, right? <laughs> I mean, it's painful, yeah. And then he told me that unless like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. He told me that unless yeah, you do crazy things in your reduction, usually this gap yeah. propagate. Yeah. And then like very recently, Barak Chan and Kotari finished this column as well. And somewhere, where does Pratik Wara fit in on this? Um, 
It's why we're mixing them. Yeah, yeah, partic or as a, it's like approximately resistant, right? Yeah, he showed some sort of gap, but I'm, I don't remember which gap. Oh, pro oh probably then it's uh, just a uh, low wash driver. Might have been low wash. Yeah. So there are like other like hierarchies known as like, yeah. And, then, and those are like stronger than Charlie Adams, or weak? I forget. No, like low wash driver is uh, weaker than Charlie Adams. Uh -huh. And then low wash driver plus is uh, weaker than um, Lasser. Uh -huh. So plus means that it uses SDP. So it's like, plus stronger than that's it. And that's not comparable, I guess, because like one is SDP and then one is uh, just LP, but uh, like this LP kind of is kind of stronger in the LP sense, but it's uh, SDP, so you can't really. Oh, I see. Okay. So now um, let me get to the technical part. The part part. That was your job. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna like so now. So um, I will probably show like, these two words. Structure form. Yeah. Yeah. So at least um, so if you just look at the gaps, actually there are like two like. Um, slightly different approaches. So this one is a one approach, and then like these guys are sort of like different approaches. And then so I'm gonna focus on this approach um, for the rest of the talk. And then actually I'll mention like why they are different. Like, so I'm gonna briefly mention the other approach as well. So let's first define um, for today. I'm just gonna define Shelley Adam hierarchy. So like T rounds of, of Charlie Adams. So there are variables. Variables are, there are many variables. Variables are indexed by um, set S and vector alpha. So S is a subset of variables with at most T variables. And then alpha is a is um is is a in is an assignment to these variables. So normally, so x s alpha um is indicates the probability that that um variables in s get alpha. So this is a usual interpretation. Even though, but this will not give a like true distribution because we are only looking at things up to size t. So this is a definition. And the program is the following. So the program is, a, so let me write the objective later. These are the constraints. It just means that so the x of empty set is just one, and then if you have two sets s and t, and then if you and then like you fix um, assignment on the smaller set s, then the probability that s will get alpha is equal to its marginal probability um, given from the larger set t.
And then with this local distribution, um, the objective is just a So given an instance, um, we call that um, each constraint ci has a um, tuple si and vector vi. So I just found this um, objective kind of like very un unintuitive, but um, it's just saying that for any constraint, look at the local distribution um, for the variables it, it contains, and then sum up the probability that it will be satisfied. So that's the definition of Charlie Adams. Could you assume that T is at least K? Yes, yeah. Anyway, we are going to show a lower bound for like linear number. Is that alpha dot beta? What is that? Sorry, why this it's one? Alpha compose. Beta. So yeah, alpha. So, yeah, so sorry. So this means that so T is a larger set. Right. Okay. Do you mean like extend to the beta assignment? Yeah. So beta, yeah, beta beta determines the assignment to like the variables in t minus s. Okay. So like this is just a concatenation. It means that like okay. things in s get alpha. Things is not in s you get beta. So this is a uh, like formal definition of Charles Adams, but I'm gonna use uh, more intuitive way. So so then like when we construct a gap for shallow Adams, which means that so given an instance, and then we are first gonna show that it opt is very small. And then we're gonna like construct a feasible solution to that LP that satisfies everything. So for that um so what we want to do is uh, for any like subset S which is size at most k, we, you want to give a local distribution. And this local distribution should satisfy two properties. The first property is that at least it needs to satisfy every constraint that is contained in this set with probably one. And then the second constraint is that, second requirement is that um, they should be consistent in this manner. So there are two requirements. So my first attempt is that um, given any like small subset S, I'm gonna look at I'm gonna look given S. So let's call um, this S to be the constraint set of constraints contained in S. And then, so if you look at just um, these constraints contained in S, then you will have uh, several um, assignments to S that satisfy every constraint contained in S. And then my first attempt is that, so H of S is uh, X satisfies S. And then my first attempt is uh, for S um, to, for its local distribution, um, just give a uniform distribution on H of S. So that's my first try. And then it will like, surely satisfy the property one. But it will violate the local consistency property by this example. So this example, I'm going to look at um, K is 4, and then we are looking at 4 X O R. So we have only two constraints. Like, that look like this. So X1, X2, X3, X4, 5, 6, and 7. And then we have only um, two constraints. But our S looks like this. So it doesn't contain any constraint, strictly. 
So this is our S. Then um, if we follow my first strategy, then it will give us like uniform distribution on every assignment of these six variables. But but at least we know that to satisfy all these constraints, even though like it doesn't um, contain any distribution, we at least know that this must be satisfied because uh, these guys must sum up to zero, and then these guys must sum up to zero. So this is a this is a problematic example for the my naive strategy. Facing y equals five six seven. Oh, sorry, yeah. So actually, and then like there are two ways to fix this. So that's how like these this work and this work. Sorry, what if what? Oh, you're saying the random segment is okay, the okay. Yeah. So like two ways to fix this. So the first way, so um, which they did, is that given S, given S, so find another like they call advice set S bar that contains S, but it has some nice properties. Nice properties. So one example of the nice property is that like what is a bad property of this subset S? It means that it doesn't contain any like constraint, but it almost contain, contains the other like constraints. So it's like fixing too many things that too many things for the constraint that it's not responsible for. So that's like so that's the problem of this uh, subset S. So we're gonna find the S bar, so and, and the S bar will roughly like intuitively have the following property. So for each constraint, it will either strictly contain it, so it's responsible for it, and then all the other things, all the other constraints, there are constraints outside, and then it like intersects in either like one or two elements with the constraints that are not strictly contained in S bar and like more quantitative version of this property. So it's not gonna fix many things for the constraints that is uh, responsible. Okay, so this is our first approach. And then, so this is uh, first introduced by these guys. And then actually, so the proof is more intuitive than what I'm gonna present. But um, it was only, it only worked for Shalans for a long time, but somehow, these guys um, prove finally finally prove that actually the same distribution also is PSD, mm -hmm. showing a certain gaps. So this is one approach, and then the second approach is that so in especially in X war we given these two constraints we deduced this um, sort of constraint as well. So we also need to satisfy this constraint. And then this x1, x2, x3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is contained in S. So why don't you like generate every deduce, deducible constraint and then and then add, add them as your like original constraints? And but, the, wouldn't that like I mean those constraints won't have size k? Yeah, but yeah, so when we do this deduction, we are only gonna keep the constraints that has a size k, size t. Okay. And you are, are you, like you'll only make, when you're doing your deductions, will you only be doing deductions of size t as well? Or will you, are you allowed to intermediately blow it no, up? Yeah. Every, everything should be within size t. I see. So this is a, so resolution proof system. Yeah, this is somewhat related to what David talked about um, previously. And then I'm gonna use this one. So 
So probably I'm running out of time, so let me just quickly finish this. Well, whatever you don't finish this time, you can just continue. I'll do sure. Yeah. Yeah, but the downside of the second approach is that actually like if x bar is actually is clear that what deduction means, we can add just two equations and then get another equation. Mm -hmm. But for like general predicates, it, it's not clear like how to add these things and deduce another constraint. So this um, resolution proof system proof is kind of like tailored towards things that is linearly representable. Mm -hmm. uh, who used the second proof system? Resolution proof system? I think it's a like I mean, so it was definitely used in Shadowback. Sure. Yeah, for like KX1 and then like Tosian extended this, Chan extended this, but I think like it was uh, well, essentially due to even earlier Grigory and other. Okay. Chan's paper is like using this approach. Yeah, yes. Rather than the first one. Yeah. I mean, Chan had a. Chan, yeah, Chan is like solo author paper, used the second approach, but like mm -hmm. his uh, BCK paper yeah. did the first one. Okay. So I'm um, just quickly gonna say. So given a predicate P, so I'm gonna now assume that it has a, um, it is a subgroup with um, pairwise independence. So which means that, so one odd vector is in, contained in P if and only if for Inner product is zero for every y in p part. So, given this fact, so given an instance, given an instance, defining p, you're defining p part. I mean, so I, I'm, I assume that p has uh, this like property two and three, oh, and some. then then like this property is true. And then I'm going to show how to replace each constraint as a bunch of linear equations. Mm -hmm. So given an instance, um, let's focus on just one constraint. So without loss of general, I mean, so let's say that S is a first k variables. Then x satisfies c if and only if, so x plus v is in p, so if and only if, for all y in p perp, that's a linear system. Yeah, so this, um, yeah, this is just a linear equation for variables. And then this is just a constant. So we can replace every constraint in this manner. So yeah, so we can replace this first constraint C1 as a bunch of linear equations. And then we can do for everything. Now, let um, large P be the set of equations. But I'm going to um, represent each equation as a tuple. So each equation is a tuple S, Y. So Y is just a bit, right hand side. And then for left hand side, I'm going to represent it as a, just a subset. So in this example, s is 3 and 5, and then y is 1. Then so I'm going to represent each equation as a, this tuple to simplify the notation. And then, so what resolution proof system, so given this initial set of equations, what resolution proof system does is that, so it takes any two equations, take s, y, and t, z. And then, then it's going to add as symmetric difference t. So we are just simply adding two equations. 
and y plus z to add to phi as long as size of this set is still at most t. So that's the resolution proof system with, with t. So we are going to do this and then we are going to and then we say that um, we refute this instance when we see this contradictory statement in large P. So um, I'm just going to say like two theorems and finish. So the first theorem says that for any epsilon greater than zero, there is eta such that such that there is an instance where opt is still very small and it cannot be refuted by resolution proof system with with eta n. So the second theorem says that if if um, it cannot be refuted by resolution proof system with with eta n, then there is a uh, then value of even lesser hierarchy with eta n over two rounds is one. The second one is the, the first one is that Ben Sasson Victor. Sasson. Yes, it's, uh, yeah, it's very cute. Actually, I wanted to explain this, but actually I'm running out of time. Probably I'm going to do it next time as well. Then second, second thing uses free analysis. Wait, so the lesser gap is just by reduction? No, it's a, and if you combine this with first and second, yeah. then like you're going to get an instance where the opt is small and then the value of the lesser is small. Oh, uh, okay. But if this, so where, so the second and third theorem is that the second theorem was by BCK? Um, it's originally by Shanabek or even earlier, this so, idea. So what did BCK do? They they proved it. The BCK, yeah, BCK was like BCK followed this other approach, right? Oh, I see. They took an advice set. Yeah, they took an advice set, and then I see. But the the novelty is that they were able to do it for pairwise independence. Yes. And this first thing assumes the group, subgroup, and the third. Problem. Yeah. So yeah. I yeah. See. This resolution proof system. I assume that everything is linearized, and then everything can ah, be right. Right. Very simple. These are two theorems, and then probably I'm going to show like some ideas how I prove these two theorems. Oh, nice. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.